。まもなく、まもなく、振り出しポットが参ります。ください。Psychology.、Um, so, Lauren had me, as I, as I mentioned in our previous podcast, we,、um, I personally enjoy doing the reading, and Lauren sent me some reading on some various like, documents dealing with like, how game designers approach player psychology. And I was actually kind of astounded that a lot of that stuff actually gets used because. I don't know. So,、yeah. for, for those how of, much it actually gets used versus like how much it's referenced, right?、Yeah. Is, is another topic. Well, it's interesting to me because so I actually studied psychology as an undergrad. And so, you know, I took courses on, I took one course on psychometrics.、Um, I took courses on social psychology and just, you know, introduction to like psycho, you know, like study research methods and things like that. And what always fascinates me about, Any like sort of these like s- systems that are often like based on or derivative from like Myers Briggs, sorry, Myers, yeah, Myers Briggs,、um, mm-hmm. or like any like personality inventories like that, which you know, most practicing like researchers in the you know, the social sciences kind of regard as crap for various reasons.、Um, But also because, like, even if you take the like the actual methods themselves as valid, like, so for example, one of them that you sent me, well, I guess I should probably, since so we can look at the same thing, share it with you. Yeah. So, like, the, you know, like the, the ocean types or like the Bartles player types.、Um, I would say that those two are, the, I would say Bartle is kind of ubiquitous. Everybody has heard of the Bartle types、yeah. in, um, Gaming, I would not agree that it's gamification. Gamification is t- completely separate from game design and game.、Yeah. Like, I was about to say game theory, but game theory is also completely different. Yeah, the, and then I will problem, say、yeah. that I just want to, and I also would like to caveat that the big five or ocean as a personality、uh, player for use in player psychology is incredibly new.、Um, especially when you look at, say, ocean. And its uses other, like in other ways, as like a psychology kind of area.、Yeah. Um, and so I will just point those both out because Ocean is new and is not kind of ubiquitous. Ocean is maybe more new, maybe more known from like, say, productions or producers. It's, it is known by game designers and game researchers as well.、Um, but everyone kind of knows Bartle. So it's these two different types of, when you look at game design, you look at game developers that go into, say, like studying their own practice. Bartle is kind of something everybody's heard of.、Yeah. And then you look at Ocean and you look at the big five from Jason Vandenberg, and that's something that not, not everybody has heard of. So, to, to introduce, well, let's start with Bartle. So, Bartle has four types.、Um, we're, we're currently looking at, at, at a document from the Interaction Design Foundation. And the four types are labeled killer, achiever, socializer, and explorer. Um, in addition to that, there's a little infographic here that sort of identifies the killer types as the smallest of those groups,、um, the socializer type as the largest of those groups, nearly it, it approximates 80% here, achiever as 10%, and explorer as 10%. I would also like to point out that this infographic seems wildly.、Um... <laughs> Wrong. If yeah. You <laughs> original re- if you look at Bartle's original resource, killers are actually the smallest, but achievers and explorers are actually more of the largest in his original、okay. um, study. And his original study was actually from MUDs, which were massive user domains, which was、yeah. a text based adventure like program similar to an MMO. So you can kind of look at Bartle for MMO design. Yeah. But the interesting thing about this to me is so let's go through each of these. So The achiever, achievers are all about points and stats. They want to be able to show their friends how are they progressing. So, achieves, you got to get the achieves, all the achieves, every achieve,、yep. 
when that little All like stats. when that little xbox logo appears in the screen you just your your entire body <laughs> tingles <laughs> all right so the, the second type the explorer explorers want to see new things and discover new secrets they're not as bothered about point surprises this is the one that i think is the most fungible category but i just want to introduce them and then we'll come back to what i think is sort of problematic about this the socializer now according to this document the vast majority of players are socializers but as lauren pointed out like that's not necessarily in sync with the original research methodology so socializers are and they, in the document, it uses the example of people who play like Farmville or like, you know, any of the numerous flash based games that have existed, like on various social media platforms over the year, like um, words with friends, say, yeah, things like you, that. You could also say that a socializer is somebody though, who typically could play like say CSGO sabotage in a like PVP setting. Like they yeah. always want to play with friends. Um, a socializer could also be someone who just plays Dance Dance Revolution, but like specifically like in a party game. Yeah. The killer is the, is... Okay, a killer denotes an ominous sounding type, but one that is nonetheless valid. Killers are similar to achievers in the way that they get a thrill from gaining points and winning status too. What sets them apart from achievers is that the killers want to see other people lose. So this is essentially, killer is probably not a great descriptor for this. This is essentially someone who is competitive. Like they want to yep. achieve while at the same time achieving over somebody else. Like they, now, they, the reason why it was originally considered, right, like you're saying, uh, Nicholas, is the reason why it was considered a killer is because in these multi-user domains, you could kill a person, right, for a person, an, an avatar, yeah. uh, right, for their loot or for, for something very specific. And so yeah. a killer was a specific type in Bartle's original research methodology. Yeah. It was someone that specifically killed them or trolled, right, or griefed, yeah. right? There's a lot of them. Oh, yeah. Um, but achiever killers were really important too, because an achiever wants to say they took down like the biggest killer, right? So yeah. there's this whole aspect to it. Yeah, and certainly in like the early history of MMOs, um, Ultima Online is a really good example of this because in Ultima Online, mm -hmm. if someone killed you, like all of your stuff dropped and they could just take it. That's straight out of it. <laughs> straight out of us. Yeah, that's yeah. so the, yeah, the the early history of MMOs is far like it gets less it act, they actually get less hardcore as they as they progress. And I guess there are people who yep. like that early brutishness of early MMOs but it never appealed to me. I, I would definitely say that Bartle influenced a lot of the early MMO decisions and as we go into the future you see this being used less and less. Yeah. But what's interesting about all of this to me is that so okay so you, you as someone who has studied this and as a knowledgeable individual like where would you put somebody who absolutely loves to play city skylines in this like taxonomy somebody yeah, who just so loves it yeah this taxonomy is really interesting because when it's just city skylines like you kind of don't say that they're like it because it's not an mmo like bartle's theory kind of breaks down for yeah. me city skylines would be someone who likes achieving and maybe someone who has a little bit of socialization um, because city skylines is about building up a new world so that it has yeah. the exploration type um i actually am a huge fan of like this just putting anything on a spectrum so for me someone who plays city skylines is like achiever explorer um i mean if they're playing the city just to burn it all down sure they have killer yeah. right and then it's like socializer because it is about creating like a city Right. So I would kind of rank it in there. Or like but also City yeah, Skylines as a game, I would say then, right, was an influence because it wants players who like achieving, right, uh, the whole, the best city. And they want players who like, right, exploring or creating new types of city layouts. Yeah. Like the game design itself doesn't allow for killers or doesn't allow for, say, socializers. Not really. Necessarily. No. Okay. Let me use a better example and something that I think actually can bring us back to what we were saying. Um, previously about sort of social slash parasocial slash so whatever whatever prefix plus social you want to append and that's minecraft which yeah. um, is essentially like minecraft is technically a game but it's almost more like lego than a game in, in the say, way that... I would say Minecraft is a game. I, I, I definitely classify Minecraft as a game. It's a sandbox. Yeah. It's a sandbox yeah, game, which is yeah. not open world because sandbox and open world are different. Yeah. But the thing about Minecraft is that it's not just the openness of the game. It's also like when discussing sort of these parasocial relationships, like Minecraft has this huge like internet per community of internet mm -hmm. personalities who play it. And those people who play it 
drive a lot of the the way in which people sort of are like pointed towards particular mods because you know the mod you know modding for minecraft is mm -hmm. insane and yes. modded minecraft can get incredibly complex and also like there are entire like like there are entire like youtube communities that were like essentially built from just like people who play minecraft and people who yep. look to them and also the fact that like because of the way YouTube's algorithms work, Minecraft videos are one of the few types of games that can actually bridge the divide into YouTube kids, which is a huge sector of like the YouTube viewership. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, then it creates this relationship between sort of like people who are like watching videos of, you know, I'm not gonna name anybody in particular, like I could, but I'm not going to, cause I don't wanna single anybody out. Please don't. Yeah, <laughs> but you have like people watching videos of particular people playing Minecraft and they go back to them regularly, they subscribe to their channel and they form a parasocial relationship with them, but it's not just mediated through like their relationship to the media that they're watching, which is sort of like the, the standard like media studies way of thinking of a parasocial relationship. It's also mediated through the game that they are also playing. Mm -hmm. They may be playing on a private server where sometimes these people, this is going back to what we were saying earlier, where that like that divide isn't as clear cut, but also they may be playing like particular modded forms of the game as a result of like things that they've seen their particular like favorite Minecraft players play or, and then all of that sort of contributes to this sort of like network of social plus parasocial plus quasi-social interactions that don't really have this sort of clear division. And the reason why I specifically bring up the example of Minecraft is because it's a different way of thinking about the logic that sort of underlies MMOs. Yeah, so it's funny because you bring up Minecraft because I feel like as I was talking about how it seems like Bartle's philosophy goes down over time, then you have a game like Minecraft and you recognize that, well, now Bartle's philosophy is just 100% right back in the forefront. It's like something that seemed to be going, I don't wanna say out of fashion, but his philosophy was just to say, there are these four types of players that play games. And it wasn't just like play all of the games for all genres, no. like Ocean was trying to cover. It was these are just people that play games that have multi multiple players, fall into these four categories. And if your game satisfies these four different types of categories, then you will have the players necessary to have an online world, right? And I don't think he was, he wasn't really making that argument, but that's the argument that came from studying Bartle's philosophy, I would say from people that followed him. Uh, I mean, myself included to a little bit because, you know, I studied Bartle and I was like, what is Bartle actually good for? Like, what is he trying to say? Yeah. Um, practically like in a, in a practical application of Bartle. So then you go and you're like, okay, Bartle's fall out of fashion. This doesn't really make sense for large scale MMOs. And then Minecraft comes out and suddenly blows everybody out of the water because now you have something that, right, allows killers, has a, like an inherent achievement, right? It's not just about Xbox achievements. It's about the inherent achievement and inherent progression. Explorers, yeah. because explorers are also creators. They get to create things that are new, right? Achievers might necessarily just want to like go through everything, but explorers will find the best way to create something, right? And then you have like the killers, right, that are just, they can grief, they can be with friends, socializers. And then there's a whole YouTube community, which now because of the way the internet has worked, when you design a game and you develop a game, uh, and not every game company does this and not every game developer, but I would argue that your online community, it actually extends as an extension of your game. So if your game is a multiplayer game and has mechanics and you don't count your online fan base or your online community as an extension of the social aspect of your game, you're doing yourself a disservice because this aspect right, can directly fuel into the participation within that experience. Yeah. And so for me, that now was like huge with Minecraft. So suddenly people were kind of like, what's the next thing after Bartle? Let's kind of put the industry forward. And then pff, Minecraft happened. And now we're like, oh, okay, let's talk about Bartle again. Uh, <laughs> not because no one else has done a, <laughs> it's not that no one else has done a study, right? Uh, it's yeah. just that, you know, no one else has really done a study. <laughs> Bartle well, was really so good. I want to go back to something that you said, which was that you, you, you made this connect, you put, made this connection between sort of the explorer type in this taxonomy and creators. 
Mm -hmm. And I don't know, like, I don't get the sense that, at least from, from what I've read about Bartle, I don't get the sense that that's what an explorer was. And in many it, ways, it definitely wasn't. It definitely wasn't from Bartle's original methodology. I'm making that extension kind of oh, as okay, my I own. Okay, I see, I see, I see what you're right? saying. As, okay, okay. Yeah, so as, as my own kind of extension on Bartle's philosophy is something that I've noticed from MUDs, you really, you, you could create, um, yeah. you, you could create items, but it wasn't like crafting, right? Yeah. With the extension of like modern MMOs and a true video game kind of like physical representation, you could say that if I put a rope against this water glass and through it, I now have like a glass whip or something, yeah. right? Um, just to have like a really specific metaphor. I'm drinking a glass of water here for our audio <laughs> viewers. I don't have any rope. Uh, <laughs> it was just a metaphor. Um, but because of the visual uh, elements of crafting, I think that creation in of itself has those two primary Bartle types in it. It has achiever. You want to create all of the items possible, right? That's huge in Animal Crossing. But yeah. then you also have, right, explorer, which is I want to know what can I create, right? And yeah. then now when you go further into the practical application, you talk about people as like collectors or hoarders, right? You talk yeah. about, we talk about people a lot of different ways, but specifically in Bertle, my personal distinction for when I do game design for multiple people is I look at what are you able to create in the space, whether it's like an, something in the environment or whether it's destruction or, right? And I think that creation and like impact on the world has elements of all Bartle's types, like social creation, explorer creation, achiever creation, killer destruction. Uh, it's not well, it's, it's sort of it's sort of the the, the classic like um, Shiva problem, where you know Shiva is so in in Hindu like yeah in, yeah yeah Shiva, Shiva's Shiva's creator, destroyer, but also at the same time is the one who like facilitates creation as a result yes. of their nihilistic like destruction. tendencies. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I will say that, and I will say that on a tendency from what I have seen, people that have are exploratory in nature, like they want to discover, tend to be explorers, and then because they want to discover, tend to be creators in the context of a game world, not necessarily yeah. creators as a content creator. So like the, the creation aspect is really interesting to me because it sort of like dovetails back to something we talked about way, 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 way at the beginning maybe even in conversations that we never recorded, which is this like, actually, no, I do remember this is in the previous podcast where you talked about sort of like the way in which like Skyrim can be used as a platform for game design and game creation. And Minecraft is like this, Roblox is like this. There are a lot of games that are like this yep. and they allow various degrees of freedom in terms of like how much you can alter like the basic game mechanics, but they still, like give you, they still hand you a set of tools whereby you can fundamentally alter or create a version of the game that you're playing. To me, that is actually somewhat different. And then I sort of like to use the example of like City Skylines where like people create assets and they, you know, they can put them up and people can download them. Like to me, that's actually fundamentally different from like, say like what you do in the game. So like, you know, in Minecraft, there is crafting yes, yeah. in the game. Like, nope. Like when you when you make the things that are part of the actual like the, the progression from like you know this particular type of tools to this particular type of tools to this mm -hmm. particular type of armor, et cetera, et cetera. To me, like that is very different from someone who actually like goes in and writes their own Luas and creates, you know, their own like block designs and like does all of the various things that sort of fundamentally no, alter. Yep. But I don't think of that as exploring. Like I I'm gonna disagree. Yeah, so for me when I talk about creation, I don't I'm not talking about modding. Modding okay. is incredibly different. Yeah. When I say creation, I mean creation within the specifics of the game world. And so it could be like in City Skylines, like I labeled it as an achiever explorer because I know that game is like, please big, but build like this perfect city within a set of parameters, right? So that's an achievement, like you need to accomplish a goal. And then exploring is just how you do that. I've actually never played, like I, 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 I shouldn't say I've never played City Skylines. I've played a little bit of it. And what I have seen is like two axes, like free play or like I need to do X amount of like tasks. Yeah, something. City Skylines is and actually in both. Sorry. Yeah, City Skylines is more open ended. Like it is much more like Lego in that it sort of it's it hands you like a set of blocks and like 
building parameters. Like there is sort of spreadsheety type management stuff in the game, but it's very easy to make. It's not like SimCity where it's actually kind of complicated to make money and you have to sort of like think about it as like you're literally building a city with actual infrastructure yeah. and you have to kind of, whereas with City Skylines, you can just build stuff and you can sort of make it look cool and you can have like, mm, you, know, you can actually yeah. create your own like ghettos and you can make like good parts, nice parts of town and bad parts of town. And you can like, social you can literally do social engineering because you're literally creating the infrastructure in which these i remember like in city skylines it was like the elevator problem where you were like where are you going to like like where your elevator sits or what floor it like sits on or something yeah so Um, but i i want to bring up like why it's why i kind of put it in exploration and if we're looking at Bartle's parameters only, I have to put it in exploration. Yeah. But if we go to other player psychology, like say Nicole Lazaro's four keys to fun, which are really like, I think eight keys, eight sub keys to achieving emotional connection with your game property. Yeah. Um, that is a hundred percent then discovery, right? Because yeah. you're kind of discovering ways, right? Yeah. So Bartle's falls down in any game that is not like an MMO or is not like the... Um, I don't want to say like the, the fundamentals of an MMO because Minecraft has like those fundamentals of an MMO. It can, Bartles yeah. is specifically a methodology for a massive multiplayer online experience. Okay, that makes sense. So so let's move on to talking about Ocean. I'll go back to my screen share for us. You guys can't see because you guys don't get to see. No. So Ocean is, so we have... The, the so-called big five. Well, actually, why don't I introduce Bartle, so why don't you introduce the big five? Sure, yeah, I will I will actually introduce uh, the big five. Um, I'm gonna caveat this like I would a thesis because I want everyone to know, um, like, because it's something you should do when you talk about things critically and objectively. Um, Jason Vandenberg was actually one of my uh, thesis, like advisors slash on my thesis committee for helping me graduate. I say helping me, but that's not really how a thesis committee works. No. Um, but he was one of the people on my master's thesis committee that w- like zoomed in to like judge my master's thesis on ludo narrative harmony. Um, I it was super great to get some of his insight into this because as like a grad student, kind of birthed uh, right from academia and kind of entrenched in trying to graduate with academia. I really wanted to kind of understand how to create an organic kind of fictional world that made sense. And I I say that really weirdly because that's what happens when you're academia. So looking at the big five, the big five is a philosophy that he ended up kind of creating at, uh, at Ubisoft at the time, trying to understand how psychology and who we are as people allows us to like how we take that into a game and how it makes us play out like the game and how can we design for people and or right reflectively, how can we look back on past right Ubisoft titles and say, how do they right look at the actual like players because players are humans. And so OCEAN uh, stands for, it is an acronym and is used in say psychology and stands for openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness and neuroticism. And he called it the big five. And he's like, these are the, we have these different five different axes for mapping, like say what game mechanics and what game design systems and fiction in our world attribute to. Then we're kind of matching the big five, uh, let's call it psychology for for life and for play. You can actually take this test. I really like it. Um, I also would like to however point out that this series from Jason Vandenberg came in three parts. It came in the big five, which was the first discussion he had on Gamma Sutra and on a GDC talk. It came in second when he was actually mapping it to more to titles and to figuring out how to apply it to game design. And then when he actually created an application based on his own research, um, he actually threw out in. So it really became the big four. (laughs) But at that point, it didn't really sound... um, like, yeah, it just wasn't the big five anymore. So we're going to be talking about the big five because that's what everybody in kind of game development who's watched the GDC talk is familiar with. But you can throw out neuroticism because he couldn't find any factor for neuroticism in any of the game design like uh, studies for what players played versus what they scored on the ocean test. Interesting, because... So what what was his just so that so his justification for throwing it out was just sort of like the failure to find or like 
an inability to find like a way to map it onto like the data that he was yeah, looking at. So, yeah. So for example, his research and concluded of two specific different, sp- two big areas. First was what do you score on ocean? So what is your ocean score? Yeah. And ocean is like, what is your spectrum of openness to experience versus, you know, closed to experiences it's not necessarily just how comfortable are you right are you a homebody or are you like no i can live in a backpack on mount fuji for like five years or a couple years and then you'll go live on a boat in the pacific ocean um he looked at what you rated on for openness conscientiousness extroversion agreeableness and neuroticism and then he compared it to what are your like what are all of the games that you had played or right ranked like one to ten or whatever and so when he did all this comparison analysis, this was the underlying foundational research, right, for the big five throughout all of these three DGC talks and through his years of research. And he found that people who had openness to experience, right, and maybe high conscientiousness were really um, drawn to experiences in the game world that were, right, high in discovery, high in exploration, high in novelty, right? They always were trying new games. And if they were high in conscientiousness, they also really liked things that maybe were skill-based and mastery. But if they were high on extroversion, well, then they were in the multiplayer titles, you could say. Low on introversion or low on extroversion, so they were more let's say less outgoing, right? Then they were actually really excited more maybe about like new Starcrafts or or things like that. Um, If they were low on agreeableness, that also leads back into Bartle uh, because of socializing. That's why I like looking at these two together. Yeah. But the reason why he threw out neuroticism was because over all of these three uh, talks, which were multiple years, because GDC happens once a year and these came a couple of years apart, neuroticism players basically was like, if you have high neuroticism, um, I mean, it is what you expect it. If you have low neuroticism, right? You're very calm, you're like Yoda, right? Um, And he found that both players of someone who say loves has high neuroticism and low neuroticism, but both would love horror games, right? And for him, he was thinking that horror was kind of the genre where neuroticism would be shown, which is like, if you don't like challenging your kind of I would completely great. disagree. Like, I think, I think that's, that's actually, this, great. Let's, maybe, like, we maybe should totally actually, talk about that. To be perfectly mm-hmm. honest, like this, this almost makes me sort of like actually want to write a paper about this because like, you know, this, this really frustrates me. You would love me. that. So one of the things, <laughs> one of the things that frustrated me about my um, studies as a, of psychology as an undergrad, and then also sort of like how I tried to dovetail it into my like, graduate studies as you know a uh, budding literature scholar is that like psychology like the the modern psychological profession such as it is shits on psychoanalysis constantly like one of the very like when i was an undergrad like one of the very first things that they would teach you in like your intro psych courses or like in your research method classes is why freud is crap mm-hmm. And what I found fascinating personally is that as I've read more like psychoanalytic theory, which is much more common in the humanities than it is in the social Mm -hmm. sciences, like how right it actually feels precisely because of all of the things the social sciences tend to overlook. And so, Lauren, do you recall a while back when we were talking about like, you know, what kind of person like loves Tetris? Or what kind of person loves... Do you remember? I do remember that. So that's a neurotic. Because the thing... So, okay. So a little little introduction to... I I definitely agree with that. So just for... To recap, if you don't remember last week's or last session's episode... Last whenever's. Last last whenever's episode. um, Someone who played Test Tourist Ray is very detail-oriented. They're very precise. They really want everything to be in the right order, which is, like you said, that is very neurotic. Yeah. And so the thing is, so like in psychoanalysis, um, particularly in sort of like Freud's later writings, there's a really famous text that if you guys want to read it, you can, it's kind of impenetrable. So read it with a friend. (laughs) It's called beyond the, (laughs) it's called beyond the pleasure principle. And in beyond the pleasure principle, he talks about this thing known as the repetition compulsion. And so the thing, the reason why the repetition, so this was in the context of sort of his own like anecdotal study of people who had experienced what we would now describe as PTSD. They didn't have that terminology Mm -hmm. for it. They called it all sorts of things like shell shock or like, you know, 
like the warriors, like the, the, the soldier's disease, they call it various things. But anyway, it's trauma. It's, it's talking about trauma. And that there is this thing that Freud noticed that people who had experienced extreme traumas would often for some reason repeat like the moment of their most extreme trauma again and again and again and again. And so this is what happens with PTSD. You have these like flashes where like you literally experience the same sensations over and over and over again that you had in that, in that traumatic, that first traumatic moment. Now the way Freud, now modern psychologists explain this very differently, but the way Freud explained it was that essentially what your brain is trying to do by repeating it over and over again is gain mastery over it, but it can't. So it gets stuck in this weird feedback loop where like it's repeating the experience to try and like get you over it psychologically, but it's so bad that you can't. So it repeats it again. And, and so you can see actually how this maps onto a certain style of gameplay where like a game like Tetris essentially presents you an impossible task. It can actually be beat. Well, I mean, I think you, there are kill screens in like older versions of Tetris games, but the whole idea is that it just so keep, bad at Tetris. It keeps, keeps getting worse. <laughs> like it keeps like it keeps getting yeah. faster it keeps getting harder and like in a perfect world it, it would reach a point where like literally no human being could possibly like keep up and the reason why this would appeal to people who are neurotic is precisely because it has that feel of a repetition compulsion it has that feel of something that like sort of it's 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 something that you have to overcome but then the moment you think you overcome it, it gets harder. You overcome it. It gets yep. harder and you overcome it. Like I absolutely love this because it goes straight back into what we we're talking about. The reason why people loved like wow classics experience and why they never wanted it to change. And also what people love, right. MMO grinds, right. It's something that like, you just get it over and over. You kill people over and over again. And then suddenly you're like, Oh, I've hit level 39. It's okay. I just need to kill some more mobs right for like another 30 hours and then i'll be level 40 but yeah. it's that grind it's that repetition which i hate i am a super low on the neurotic score i am almost like zero neuroticism um i'm extremely neurotic score. so maybe that's why I, I, this like, is why we work so well together because <laughs> no, but it, also, I, it's her, it kind of explains why i like games like tetris or like games like luminous or I games can't. where I like can't. literally like or games like City Sky, even City Skylines is an erotic game because it's literally about sort of like ordering things and putting them all the way that you like it. I, I think we need to write a paper on this for academia.edu because let Absolute, me tell you, like, honestly, I have been yeah. trying to, <laughs> yeah, honestly, yes. I have been trying to figure out what makes neuroticism, like what kind of game could be in that for the longest time, but I am not neurotic. So I literally was just kind of like, I don't know why anybody would. No, it, and it, like, it was, <laughs> so so yeah. No, when I when I found out that that Vanderberg had had like th thrown this out, I was like, why? Like to me, it was just so blazingly obvious. I'm like, psychoanalysis has already given you the answer to this question. You don't actually need an elaborate like. To remember, he also wasn't just a full time study. researcher. Yeah. I mean, he was a creative director yeah, and a yeah, lead yeah. game no, no, designer. No. Like, he had another full time I'm, job. No, I'm, not, so he's I'm, not trying probably... to, I'm not trying to dump on the guy. Like, cl clearly, he was trying to tackle a problem that he thought he had a solution to, and that he ran. I mean, people. When you're a researcher, like I can say this as someone who does research, like you run up against things that you beat your head against for like years sometimes, and then like somebody oh, comes yeah. along and just goes, "Oh no, that's that," and you're like. I hate you. <laughs> like it's, I hate, I hate you. <laughs> so oh, much I, lo right I now. love this because this is, this is exactly why you can't throw out. Like I knew there was like a, you couldn't throw, throw no, it out in terms can. of the game design that he, the, the talk that he was giving was here's how to design these types of games. And he's like, I don't know how to design for neuroticism. So we're not going to talk about it. And so he threw it out. Right. Animal Crossing. Um, Animal Crossing is another perfect example of a game that is great for neurotics or Harvest Moon or in fact, actually, yeah, Harvest Moon is a really good example of this because it's another game in which it has like habitual repetitive cycles in which you sort of like have to maintain okay. the world that you that you're playing in. Here we go. So I would say that past Animal Crossing is really fit high into the neuroticism. Yeah. And I would also start, this is, this could be the reason why people have a line somewhere in some, some circles where it's, do you do Stardew Valley 
or do you play Animal Crossing? Yes. And I think that's really interesting is because I could get into Stardew Valley, but it is too neurotic. There's too much maintenance and repetition for me. But in Animal Crossing, there, yes, you end up doing the similar like activities, but everything that comes out of a similar activity is different. And I could never get into the older Animal Crossings because they were too repetitive. I was like, yeah. why would I be doing these boring tasks? But in new Animal Crossing, I'm finding myself very excited, not just because I'm a vampire who has a giant pumpkin patch, <laughs> but mainly because I'm a vampire who has a pumpkin patch, um, but also because the things, the benefit that I get from it is really new. And I yeah. understand that I'm still, I just kind of just started. So I'm still kind of in the t- tutorial area. Yeah. yeah, like Animal Crossing requires you to play it every day. And there are things that you have to do yeah. But at the same time, it's more new Animal Crossing is more forgiving and yes. it allows you to kind of explore different solutions or different, I guess, outcomes for the same activities versus Stardew Valley. If you chop wood, you're chopping wood and you will get wood and that's it. Like nothing. Yeah. I guess you build a fire, right? You do whatever you need <laughs> because to do with it. And that's in, it. That, in that sense, Stardew Valley is much more like Harvest Moon. It's essentially like yes. Harvest Moon with the like role playing elements bumped up smidge yeah it's funny because i loved harvest moon but i like played i only played year one i like couldn't and i tried playing past year two and i got to year two and then after that i was like i'm not going to do this for i don't know how many years there are i think you like watch your son grow up or something you can play it kind of endlessly to be perfectly honest yeah honestly i mean there there is there is a point where like you know you can get married and you know you form relationships and and you do sort of achieve in many ways in the same way in life you achieve certain like goals and you can do that in harvest moon because in many ways no you're supposed to die at the end of harvest moon and like pass on the farm to your son or your son well that's what i'm saying is but but whatever but you do get but you do get to a point well before that where it's like you're sort of done no, I, I was done after yeah. I married the girl. I was like, look, I yeah. got the girl. Apparently she's the really hard one to get and I got her to love me. So check mark. Um, but for, I can but propose for, now. But for someone who is of this hypothetically, I mean, I don't like tax. I mean, you know this about me. I don't like I, taxonomies yeah. when it comes to like talking about individual psychology. But if we're working in this framework, like the person who then persists after that in playing that kind of game, like a Harvest Moon or Stardew Valley, Animal Crossing, et cetera, et cetera, is precisely of the neurotic type because yes. they're enjoying it's Because again, it, it's, it goes back to the, the literal title of Freud's book is because it's not about a pleasure impulse. It's not about like, ooh, play game. Like, you know, when you're playing Call of Duty, there's a sort of like, perverse satisfaction like you you kill something and the blood splat- splatters everywhere and you go, like that's that operates on that operates on the pleasure principle like you, you, you derive pleasure from this no the, i, I the, get it from murder get simulation it. essentially but when you're talking about someone who like habitually comes back to the same game over and over and over again it has nothing to do with that sort of like pleasure reaction it's much more about sort of like maintaining control over like these creeping negative thoughts, negative emotions that like you perform mastery in this world precisely because you can't adequately perform mastery over your own negative emotions and your own That is like a hundred percent true because if you look at the way, if you look at our current like political climate and you look at our current world climate, like globally, like Animal Crossing has really been right a saving game for a lot of people because when you do not have the ability to go outside, you don't have the ability to engage with other humans outside to, to socialize with friends, to have any sort of outside impact. You suddenly have a game where that is literally everything you can do. You can go outside, you can breathe clear air. You don't have to wear a mask or, or you can, Yeah. right? Um, you can visit your friends, you can build a house, you can do things that like, especially right in California, like no one's gonna build a house in California. Like if you, like that's, if you are like, good for you, I'm super, super <laughs> proud of you or proud of whomever gave you the money to build a house. Or maybe oh, you, or maybe you need therapy because you're clearly a crazy person. Yeah, or clearly, <laughs> clearly, you you need to stop building in these wildfire territories. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, but 
But that being said, and also for all of those who did build their homes and lose them, I would like to just take a moment for you to recognize that I am not shedding, uh, making fun of any of your plight. That is a huge thing. But in yeah. regards to Animal Crossing, Animal Crossing in a weird way is more persistent than your physical representation of your reality. Yeah. And so Animal Crossing, right? Ha- there's so many negative emotions. If neuroticism is dealing with all of these strong experiences of negative like emotions and negative feelings, Animal Crossing is the perfect right, neurotic kind of escape to deal with all of that. Well, yeah, because everything in the game is knowable in a way that, th- yeah. that sort of the particular, like, again, it, it's, you're right to point to this, the current, it's not just the political situation, it's the entire, like, social circumstances in which we currently find ourselves. A lot of it is political, but also a lot of it is just sort of like, you know, the the early onset of climate change and like the fact that like all of this stuff is going to get worse, the realization that it's probably going to get worse, that we don't necessarily, like, that we may even know what to do about it, but sort of like the political will and sort of just the communal will isn't mm-hmm. there to yeah. do it. And yeah, like you don't have, you don't know how to fix that. You don't know how to maintain that. And it's like, there is a certain comfort in, you know, waking, like speaking as a parent, like there's a certain, it, it's like the, what is it? Like the, the dopamine reaction in, you know, in terms of like hormones where there is a, there's a kind of ease and a kind of like regulation that literally happens in your um, brain chemistry as a result of engaging in repetitive habits and so like waking up in the morning having your cup of coffee or like getting your kids ready for school or like listening to a podcast as you walk to work like those those daily things that you do help you maintain that kind of like psychic balance that wouldn't otherwise be there if you didn't have those things whereas i mean some people are okay with being like in constant upheaval but a lot of people aren't and a lot of people need that sort of reassuring presence of those repetitive things and in a world where like so much of that is being disrupted in your real life a game can actually provide at least the feeling of balance if not the reality of balance I absolutely, I love the way that you phrased that because I think for me, something that every practical, say, game designer out there, or just maybe longtime gamer in general out there is thinking, and I include anybody who plays, like, say, from Candy Crush to Words with Friends, like, you're a gamer. That's what I'm talking about. And that's who I'm talking to right now. Um, When you phrased it that way, it really shows that people, when we look at like games as an escape from your current situation, we tend to talk about escapism, that games offer something that the real world can't. And it used to be in this right perfect world where reality was great and everybody had a house and the picket fence and did or did not have kids or had like a dog and right. And I, I bring that up because then we talked about it as an escape. Like for some reason, reality was just so hard that you needed to escape. Or was boring. Or was insufficient. Yeah. Or was boring, right? Yeah. It was insufficient, right? But now we're living in a world, right, where it's been completely upturned. And it's not that the real world is boring or insufficient. It's that so much is going on and that is reflecting it. That it's not so much about looking at games as an escape, but more about right? That return to the normalcy, return to balance. I think that's really, really great. And kind of that maybe next step when we look at our games criticism, because it isn't about creating an escape for people and that can be creating a relief for people, right? And that's, that's really where games are are about. So I don't know if you, if you've ever watched any of this guy's videos, there's this um, psychologist who streams fairly regularly. And he also does YouTube videos that are from his stream. Um, What is his name? I can't remember. Dr. K is what he's usually called, but I, I should remember his actual. It's Alok something. Alok. I cannot remember his last name. I don't know why. Dr. K. Anyway, he's this guy who has this company now called Healthy Gamer. And again, I have quibbles. I always have quibbles with things, but I don't like to begin from my quibbles. One of the things that he he does as part of his sort of like larger project is to think about gaming in a therapeutic way. Mm-hmm. Um, and that involves all aspects of gaming. It involves the social aspects, games themselves, but, and sort of his shtick is more focused on sort of like 
getting people within sort of like the broader gaming community, which he, I feel like he defines pretty narrowly. Maybe he doesn't, maybe if I, maybe if you pressed him on it, he wouldn't define it narrowly, but it feels pretty narrow, much narrower than you're talking about, but sort of getting people within that community to adopt much more healthy, like mental habits. And so, you know, he teaches meditation, he teaches all sorts of things. Like he's, he is himself um, Indian, and so he has like a real grounding in um, Hinduism, but also in Buddhism as well. And so like he teaches a lot of that spiritual practices in addition to um, just like ordinary, like psychotherapy. And I definitely want to give him a look because yeah. something that I think you would really appreciate on that vein of say game as a, as like therapy and as therapeutic is um, Jane McGonigal did a TED talk about how video gaming saved her life. Ugh. People usually talk about, hold, hold on, I know, I know. When people usually talk about this, they always talk about Jane McGonigal. So um, this, no, no. you or McGonagall. Or Mag McGonagall. McGonagall. Um, what you're not privy to. It is, is McGonagall. It is McGonagall, yeah. Um, what you're not privy to is the fact that like in my house, so my, my partner, my spouse is probably a jane mcgonagall fan although she also has quibbles as well i am a jane mcgonagall detractor and we the, the the reason the reason why this was was an ug moment for me is because i am like, completely I have neutral had, to jane mcgonagall i have had this <laughs> argument so many times in my day-to-day -day life and the thing is like um with, with my wife it is genuinely very productive because she's probably well it's, it's weird because like she's very smart we're equally intelligent but she's far more successful than i am like she has parlayed her like skills far better than I have. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that she's just a much more pleasant person than I am. I'm, I am deeply unpleasant in many ways. You're a nice high neuroticism. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But uh, sort of, well, I think we'll have to talk about Jane McGonagall in the future. We should, it, we should definitely talk about yeah. Jane McGonagall in the future after I've had a chance to watch her TED talk and maybe read some of her things um i will say that i once dated a guy who was a huge jane mcgonagall fan um but whenever someone's like a fan of someone i just i instantly have quibbles yeah like with the concept of exactly. like idolizing someone that way and then so i already have like a, my critical cap on which is i'm just like mm, i don't think they deserve it like which no offense to jane mcgonagall of whom i'm completely neutral on um i I am sure she is doing absolutely great work. And I do think that she's like the fact that anybody can create that type of division, right. And derisiveness between different people is awesome. Yeah. Like I love that already, but yeah, I just will say that um, it's, it's definitely a larger topic and it's not a player psychology. Topic. It is a little bit, but yeah, it's certainly not in, in this vein. So go, yeah. but, so we should actually go back to, we've, we've digressed a little bit. We should probably go back to sort of the, the big five, and even though we've kind of, I think we're kind well, of, in a, I think we're in agreement that we, that like there is an approach to neuroticism and then we need to sort of table that because maybe we should actually write about it together, but we didn't actually talk about, so we talked about openness and how that would parlay, but we didn't talk about conscientiousness, extroversion and agreeableness and how those yes. parlay into games. Yeah, so Bozo. I would, yeah, you're like, Bozo. Bozo. Um, yeah, so I don't know, for me, when I look at, when I look at the, uh, when I look at up. conscientiousness, you think you should bring it back up for me? Yeah, just so like, yeah I'm, I don't, right there. I, I keep clicking share screen and then it doesn't happen. Yeah, so we there we go. Openness to experience. I think that's really easy. When we look at uh, conscientiousness, right? Yeah. Um, I think that for me, conscientiousness is a straight line to progression. It's anything that allows you to okay. like level up in your skills. Um, anything yeah. that really can show you like you have mastery, right? You really have like control over that domain, um, right? And then low conscientiousness, right, is maybe more of that. Um, I was maybe more of that sandbox, right, environment. It's not so much about mastery, right, as it is just like trying. Tinkering, out. yeah, it's a tinkering mentality. Right, it, it's tinkering. You're just like, yay, life is life is life is good. Um, uh, with extroversion, extroversion is usually defined, right, as like, do you high, right, high social versus like, um, right, low, low social, but also in like the context of the big five, it's actually all about like external simulation is how much do you need to be externally motivated yeah. uh, versus how much can you be internally motivated? 
I actually, yeah. I think I've ranked somewhere in the fifties. I tend to rank in the, like the 50% or really close to zero one, whatever yeah. you, um, whatever you rank on for extroversion, because like, I want to be externally motivated because I need to be sometimes, but at the same time, like if I am really excited about a mechanic, I am now internally right motivated. I don't need any external stimuli, uh, for that. So, so the that could be a game. So Sorry? the in, so the introversion extroversion like distinction actually goes back to psychoanalysis. It actually specifically comes out of like Carl Jung's writings, um, and it was from Jung that Myers and then later Myers and Briggs actually sort of created this introversion extroversion axis, sort of axis as in a a x i s. Um, the the major problem with it is that. Uh, you know, Jung was not a great social psychologist, to be perfectly honest. He, he, he wasn't, but I and, love him anyway. And it's, 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 so, <laughs> so, so, so the fundamental problem, and I think what, what your case actually points to, is the fact that, like, there, there, well, one, there's a fundamental problem of sort of trying to extrapolate, like, intrinsic individual psychology from social behaviors. Like, that's fraught to begin with, because we be like, so much of our behavior essentially, like, works in a like in a two directional fashion, because it's never just how the, like your internal motivations are pushing you and how external motivations are pushing you. Like, because there's always both and they're always both interacting mm -hmm. in somewhat perverse ways. So like you can have social circumstances where someone who is say like, what we describe as KG, generally speaking, but like when put in a particular like social circumstance, like there is the relationship between sort of like their internal world and sort of like the way the external world has been presented to them where it sort of creates this weird like match where suddenly they appear to be someone who is extroverted, but it has nothing to do with extroversion. It has everything to do with sort of like the, those, those two things kind of lining up with each other. And you see this, especially in a lot of performers, you see it in, in a lot of musicians, you see it in a lot of actors even people who we tend to think of as being kind of like outgoing and gregarious. A lot of actors are actually really introverted people. And part, yeah, of the, and, and, the, and part of the reason why they're often so good is because when you see them on screen or when you see them on stage, like their internal like caginess and sort of constantly being in themselves and constantly thinking in their own heads, like they have developed in their own minds schemas for how to portray social interactions because it's not natural to them. And so then when they're put in a situation where sort of social interactions are unnatural, like in a film, and then they think of social interactions as unnatural, that those two things actually line up with each other and they do really well. And they appear to be very outgoing precisely because of that sort of like bi-directional interaction. Yeah. And so to take this, uh, I could get very like personal in my own experiences with how I am incredible. I have been set as a very good conversationalist uh, simply because I do have an issue with a lot of social situations, but because I moved around so much as a child. So I very much uh, empathize with like that actor mentality of having any sort of social interactions like a film for me, any social interactions are already very weird. And there are divined right schemas for how you should behave yeah. in a variety of social situations. So looking at those, right, that actor mentality of the devised social, social uh, air quotes here, uh, yeah. schemas, when you look at a game design, you constantly have that play between your external motivation and your internal motivation within a game. So when you're designing for the trait of extroversion, I would argue that you're really designing more for what is the external, say, objective or external stimulus or external yeah. motivation for playing this game. Yeah. And it could be within the game itself, or it could be, right, the social experience of you need to get your weekly rate in in World of Warcraft. Yeah. Or it could be your internal right motivation for I want to level up. I want to yeah. progress. I don't need anything external to stop me from playing this game. And or to start me, yeah, to stop me or to start playing this experience. Or to keep me or to keep right? me going. Yeah. Or to keep me going. Yeah. Right. And extroversion, I personally love the this this uh I love the E, I guess, of ocean, but I love the idea of motivation and player player motivation and player choice and yeah. that implicit and explicit right um areas surrounding the player complex a lot as a designer because it's really the most challenging yeah. to figure out how do you get the player 
right? Immersed in that experience. But how do you get the player wanting to play the game both implicitly? And then how do you use ex explicit, right? Ex uh, motivation to get yeah. into it. Well, uh, this is where I think the genius of indie games often comes in. I mean, a lot of indie games are crap, but a lot of indie games are also good in the same way that a lot of AAA games are crap and a lot of AAA games are good. Um, but one of the things, one of the major advantages that an indie developer has is because their game is on a much smaller scale, they can actually cater to more niche audiences. And so, and so like the, the thing is when you're making a triple A game, like in order for that game to make money, you have to appeal to the broadest swath of people that you possibly can. And so you're trying to find essentially like the common denominator of as many different types of people as possible, which is why a lot of triple A games tend to follow like well-worn paths. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm hoping for is in more AAA experiences to actually look at the diversity of the world that we have. Yeah. And I want those experiences to then find those niches and then just appeal to a lot, right, of niches. Yeah. Like that's, yeah, what yeah. I, that's what I would like. To create, right? Yeah, to create space. And this is actually something that MMO MMOs can do very well because they can create a lot of different niches for people. That Like the game doesn't mm -hmm. have to be one thing to everybody. It can actually be like a few thousand things to yes. a bunch of different types of people. I mean, and that's why I absolutely love MMO design because when I was growing up, I had to be a lot of different things. And so for yeah. me as a designer, as a game developer, MMO design is kind of just a part of my design philosophy because like you don't have to be one thing to a lot of people. You're already, right, 10 things to every single different, right, to thousands of people. Right. So this is a very exciting thing and we can go more into player motivation maybe later. Um, yeah, I know we're we need to touch on agreeableness. We already have, we already have a massive list of things to talk about in the yes. future. Okay. So, but, but before we both completely run out of steam, let's talk about agreeableness and then we'll, we'll wrap up a little bit. So agreeableness. Yeah. Take so agreeableness. Yep. So agreeableness uh, on the Gamma Sutra article that we're looking at saying is that it deals with cooperation and social harmony. Right, a high score would be Charles Xavier, who puts the needs of others ahead of his own, right, and believes in good of people. Versus, like a low score would be Snake uh, Pluskin, who, if you want to care him, if you want him to care about another human being, you have to inject an explosive into his neck. Um, basically, I would actually say that if you just look at it from a human perspective, right, agreeableness is somebody who would save the life of someone else before themselves. Right, like that's that's the classic quintessential right paladin good guy, right? And then yeah. someone who's agreeable, who's unagreeable, right? And also in scare quotes here for listeners, is that they would put their own life before the life of someone else. I'm gonna use this because this is a very clear cut example to something like any first person shooter, where it's like, and especially specifically in a multiplayer environment. If you are a high agreeable as a person, you will see yourself as a team leader or a team protector or a team captain. It is about the safety of your players and your crew. It is not necessarily about taking out the other team. It is also not necessarily about taking out um, or like you would put yourself in front of harm's way. High agreeableness could also then be in an MMO translated to someone who is a tank. Could also be maybe someone who's a healer. Or a raid leader. Actually, I would probably say something. Or a raid leader. A raid leader or a guild yeah. leader or somebody who has that sense of like care. Care is really a good way of thinking about it. Like care, yeah. yeah. I think I think that's actually a much better way of putting it is care. Because low agreeableness is someone who isn't necessarily an unagreeable or bad person. It's not that they don't value the lives of other people and it's not that they have self-preservation at their heart. So I'm not necessarily agreeing with this, uh, I guess, paragraph description here, but it's just somebody yeah. that like, they're not the raid leader. They're a raid member and they're probably damn good at their job, but like, they're not gonna lead the raid, yeah. right? And they may not be a tank thing. They could be a healer, but maybe they're a shadow priest, right? They'll heal sometimes, but they'd rather be doing damage. Right. Yeah. Or maybe they're a tank and they'll taunt people, but for them, it's more about just getting stronger as a tank and being able to withstand a lot of damage. They don't really lead as the tank. Maybe someone else leads, right? Uh, in a first person shooter, someone with low agreeableness you could say is someone who doesn't care about the needs of the team, but they could be more of that lone wolf figure, which is also just as good. Yeah. So it's like, you know, if we're talking, if we think about this in like D&D &D terms, it's like the classic distinction between like the the lawful category and the chaotic category, mm -hmm. the lawful category. And, and the thing, and I do say the lawful, not good, neutral or evil, because the, the yep. way the way lawfulness is defined, designed is that you have the sort of like 
the way things are supposed to be done, it's about responsibility. It's about sort of like maintaining order. It's about maintaining like harmony and cohesion. Like you can have lawful evil characters precisely because they're, they're weird and they do bad things and they do morally abhorrent things, but they do them because they feel as if it maintains a social order. Whereas you can also have chaotic good characters, which, you know, is your sort of classic anti-hero type who like believes that morality trumps everything else. And that like you, that order is not to be valued over. So the, the chaotic spectrum is precisely about like, I need to achieve things by whatever means are available to me. And if that means that you sort of ruin like all of your social relationships, you burn all your bridges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, like fine, because like your goal, your sort of your moral compass, be it good or bad, is what guides you not like maintaining like a responsible relationship to other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so actually to look at this not so that's Dungeons and Dragons is lawful and chaotic. Let's actually put that onto like t any TV show that you see. Yeah. A lot of TV shows have people that are the rogue elements as their leaders, right? Sherlock yeah. is also very chaotic. Um, Jethro Gibbs and NCIS, which is a weird reference, but <laughs> um, but I mean, any listeners out there that watch NCIS, Gibbs is your chaotic agent. Yeah, he's yeah. good, but he doesn't really care. He's going to get the job done, right? And a lot of animes have their protagonist as a chaotic character because it is against right this lawful oppressive right society or kind of government agency well and it also has a, so this this goes it's this a, dovetails into it's my media my media studies background which has a lot to do with the fact that particularly in like shonen manga you've seen this a lot in like there, there's good examples of this like okay so um attack on titan before it got super fashy was like this um, and no, actually, the best example of this is a really great manga slash anime called um, Assassination Classroom, Ansatsu Kyoshitsu. Um, and the reason why it's fantastic is because it is it is a classic like like high school like slice of life manga, but it's done in such a way that it basically critiques the way Japanese society was organized, and it does it by sort of presenting these like essentially like loser students and their relationship to like and they're all supposed they're oh so the basic story basic plot line is they have to kill their own their own teacher and the reason why they have to do this is because they're trying to get out of being at the bottom of the totem pole and it reflects a lot of the ways in which particularly the japanese educational system tracks people in such a way in such ways and that there is i mean if you read the sociological literature about japanese schooling there's this huge area there's this huge field that's all about bullying um and in fact a lot of japanese sociologists actually make a distinction between the the term in japanese for bullying ijime and what is sort of classically thought of as bullying in you know a western context because they would argue that bullying in like you know the west is understood as sort of like a relationship between individuals whereas ijime is a social structure it is it essentially like the way in which the system bullies you rather than the way in which sort of like an individual yeah. bullies you so to give a really concrete example <clears throat> right in an individual's an individual american right society like say school system when the kids are playing at the schoolyard like in recess right someone that has identified themselves as a bully whether they're just stronger or they have more friends or they're popular or whatever you want to go in that schema will bully someone who say has less of that individually like they even if they have say lots of friends maybe they just look weaker or whatever right yeah. this society is very individualized um but to to nicholas's point on the japanese society like imagine and this is not to comment specifically on your area of expertise but to give an example imagine like it's a system that then says has a law that says say third years are able to ask first years and below right, to do chores for them, right, and then has a list of what constitutes chores. This could be a very easy way for a third year to bully a second or a first year, but basically stating, hey, you have to do all of my chores now, thereby shirking responsibility. But the system, right, is built to continually promote this type of bullying or hazing because it's actually in a law versus there is no, say, systemic law or, like, thing on recess that says if you are a stronger American child at the age of six, you can bully someone who is a weaker, right, at the age of five. Yeah, right? and, and also, as soon as you like, hit 
educators in the U.S. are legally responsible for intervening. They may not necessarily do an effective job of it, or they may be they may turn a blind eye to that sort of behavior, but they are technically supposed to actually intervene and prevent it from happening. Whereas a lot of Japanese sociologists have pointed to the ways in which, like the structure of educational environments themselves facilitates precisely what Lauren is talking about. It facilitates this sort of like hierarchy, hierarchization of students in their relationships to other in a way in which then certain students within particular classrooms can almost then become sort of like the middle managers for the social order within a given school, even in, to the point of like enforcing rules on its behalf. And that's very different from, I mean, you used to see something like this in American schools, but not, I can only say like as someone who has worked in Japanese public schools that like, you, you don't, you don't understand. <laughs> you really just don't understand. Yeah, like it is, I would, I would definitely say that if you watch any anime or read any manga out there and you have any of that type of, you see those underlying tensions within the manga and the anime itself, specifically of right? That, that student body or student council president that seems to be acting on behalf of the school and not yes. on behalf of the students. Because right? they usually versus are. In Ameri- because they usually are. Versus in American literature, when you have the student body like president or student council president, it usually is about making the student bodies, right, voices heard. And while that say is on paper, maybe what it is in like in Japanese school, it is usually actually reversed. I will note that like this is not universally, this is the caveat, like this is not universally true of Japanese schools, but because tracking especially is so much more common there, like as a result of that, and also like there, there are informal hierarchies of public schools and also sometimes even formal hierarchies, like people who live in a particular area, they know which high school is the best. And, you know, that's the same in the Western context as well. But whereas in the Western context, that's usually sort of like, they're usually segregated by wealth more than really anything else. In Japan, since you have like formal entrance procedures, and this is true in like most East, East Asian countries, you see this in Korea, you see it in China, because there is a formal process for like admission and you generally have to take seat, sit in an exam of some kind, as a result of that, like it's very gated. And because it's gated, like it creates this like hierarchization that in that exists in Western schools, but is more informal, whereas it's much more formalized in East Asia. Yeah. And so to bring this also into like, say, games and how it relates to game design, I want to bring up Persona 5, because Persona 5 is that like dichotomy of high school, like slice of life simulator, where you're just a high school student at a certain academy with right at night, you go out and you like fight demons. And on the on all Persona series, like, and you look at Japanese culture, you wear student uniforms and they know who you are by what uniform you wear versus in America, we don't wear, well, some schools do wear uniforms. I will say that. And if you see anyone in a school uniform, you're probably thinking, ugh, like what school are they going to? Right. Like as an American, you're like, nobody wears uniforms, but when you do see it, you're like, okay, they must be wealthy or it must have graded end, or it must be, or they're a foreigner and they're just walking around in their school uniform. Um, but since we don't have uniforms, you can't really look at anybody who's your age or right in, in a school sphere, or even as an adult, you don't just look at them across the street and say, oh, that person goes to a wealthy school. Yeah. You might, if you like happen to know their brand of clothing or something, but you just can't tell. But in Japan, since the markers are so distinct, you can look at like, say a group of students and know immediately what they scored on their entrance exam probably where their family background is from or what they had available to them or what opportunities they didn't have available to them. Yeah. You can see how much money they do or don't have simply from what they're wearing, right? And yeah. it's that key telltale marker that Persona 5 does really well, both on its characters, like the characters, also the character you play. And that's why a lot of that kind of storyline for some of those characters feels a little flat in the English translation, because you don't really get those markers of being able to kind of connote like, oh, that's why that person is treating you that way. Um, because like in Japan, it's just so normal. Yeah, the, those the sort of like, unspoken, like social indicators and social codes, they're, they're always difficult to translate. Mm-hmm. And 
but I don't always think that it's actually, so this, this is sort of me putting on my translator hat as well. Like a lot of this also has to do with, there is a certain, I want to call it an ideology that exists within like localization. Um, if you follow say like anime translators or manga translators or even game localizers on Twitter, you'll start to see very quickly that they tend to fall within a certain like type, especially with regards to like presumptions about how things are supposed to be translated. And it's also interesting to me that they're also usually very antagonistic to fan communities. Um, yeah, tran tran I mean, I never, I never studied localization, but like I was definitely, I was part of right the voice acting crowd because I ran an anime convention for a few years. Yeah, and so I really, I really got to see right the localization kind of like firsthand, or like the two methodologies that I saw. But so I'm really excited to actually hear it for someone who has. Real well, what's interesting about knowledge. it is that is that sort of like fan a lot of fans and, and fan communities are not homogenous by any stretch of the imagination but there is a very large and often very vocal part of like anime manga fandom who want more of those sort of so in translation studies we we have this sort of like dichotomy between what we call like there's this thing known as domestic domesticization so the mm -hmm. more you domesticize something the more you sort of take something from this other culture and you make it resemble like something in the target language. This is a complication with English because English doesn't have a culture associated with it. There are a lot of cultures that speak English, but like, let's say you were translating <laughs> from like Japanese into Italian. Like if you were domesticizing things, then like you would, you would use like Italian school terms, you would use Italian terminology for things. You would get rid of all of the honorifics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a really great meme example is the jelly donuts from Pokemon when yeah. I think Misty and Ash are having a Which picnic and they're like, let me get to this. <laughs> let me, though, let's bring out the jelly donuts and they open up onigiri, which for anybody, yeah. if you don't know what an onigiri is, it's a triangle shaped rice. And the only thing with filling inside of it. And the yeah. only thing that the domestication uh, translation at the time could think of, which was somewhat triangle shaped and had filling was a jelly donut. Yeah. <laughs> That's domestic. That's a. That's what, is it? what did you say? Dem domesticization. So domestic. Domesticization. So, so to Domestic domesticate, domesticate something. <laughs> so the idea. So, but there, but particularly within sort of like more progressive thinking sort of theories about translation studies, like there are a lot of people, especially like if you if you were in a translation studies MFA program now, domesticization like domesticating things is that's bad yes very bad <laughs> and the reason for that is because there is a growing not growing in fact it's pretty much the dominant sense that like part of what you do as a translator is try not to efface like what texts themselves are doing and sort of like communicating their culture as well and so mm -hmm. I think what a, what a very large section of anime manga fandom want is they want media that reflect that cultural communication. The problem is the ethos that exists amongst professional translators is exactly the opposite. Like domestication, very good as far as they're concerned. Like that's the dominant yeah. ideology. Yeah, and so what I would say also though to Persona 5, particularly I'm not sure in Persona 5 Royale if they had another localization pass, but replaying Persona 5, um, which yes is a 100 hour game, um, just for anybody who does want to play this game, please play Royale. It's a lot easier. Yeah. Um, I will actually comment that Persona 5 Royale's localization and translation actually feels a lot closer to the original Japanese context. I am also listening to it with Japanese like audio. And then I have English subtitles because yeah. I feel like I can get the nuances of the culture better. And because I also do speak a little bit of Japanese, enough high school Japanese to, yeah. to, to understand a little bit of the intonations of what they're saying. But yeah. then when I get the right English, I fully understand it, obviously. And I would say that the translation feels a lot more solid in the Persona 5 game versus the Persona like 4 or even Persona 3, which had more of the domesticization. Yeah, generally, if I can play games in Japanese, I usually try to do so. And generally, without sub I try to, try to play without subtitles. Um, for the I just, simple... I'm just not there yet. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, it's yeah, different levels of fluency. It's whatever. But no, the the point, the reason why is because, like, subtitles can be kind of a crutch, because there are there are even things that like subtitles, like even with sort of like the combination of subtitles and sort of like 
a working knowledge of original Japanese, you will fall into using the subtitles as a crutch for your understanding, and you will actually miss things that you wouldn't if you were sort of focusing more on like the Japanese expression. Um, at least I find that. But again, that requires... I totally a, agree with you. Yeah, requires it just requires a level requires of fluency a... that honestly most people don't have. Yeah. So, so thankfully playing the game again, <clears throat> like I think that one of the character's storylines did not come across to me at all and I did not like the character. Playing it a second time, I actually was, I kind of knew what was happening. So I didn't really read the subtitles as often and was able to kind of listen to the nuancing, which helped me better understand the character. Yeah. And so I actually ended up liking them a lot more because I concentrated more on the Japanese. So if you are someone in that, it goes, uh, it goes without saying that this is for any language as well, whether it's Spanish yeah. or right, Italian or French, like listening to it, right. And figuring out that nuance. Well, Lauren, this has been absolutely fantastic. And we went much longer than we had originally planned to. So um, before we or at least before we stop recording. <laughs> um, are there any shout outs? Is there anything you'd like people to know where to find you? How to contact you? How to leave you alone, et cetera, et cetera. How to form a parasocial yes. relationship. Yes, you can form a parasocial relationship with me on Twitter or Instagram at the Lauren Ash. Um, we definitely did go a little bit longer, but this has been super exciting to just talk about this. Yeah. I don't want to just end on the translation note. The reason why no. okay, it came yeah, out not. of... Um, it came out of agreeableness is specifically because translation and a lot of these games and um, when they are imported media, you can really kind of see how cooperation and social harmony is yeah. different among right cultures. Yeah. And so looking at this type of imported, I would say imported games and particularly right Japan uh, games imported to America and American games imported to Japan. Um, it's just the strongest relationship we have in video games. Uh, right, Final Fantasy, World of Warcraft, yeah, yeah. two MMOs, how they determine, right, what is cooperation and social harmony and what they determine as agreeableness is very different, right, than each other. And this is why you get a variety of games that say emphasize a different, right, social or parasocial relationship with the term of agreeableness. And because it is about that cooperation and social harmony, it really gets into those those philosophies as well. Absolutely. Although I will note that actually, I recently discovered this, but apparently, um, like, WoW is bigger in China than even like the rest of the world. Like the the, chi the Chinese yes. market for WoW is absolute. Like it dwarfs all of okay, the. Okay, so markets. on that note, I actually <laughs> from one of the one of the original creators of Mists of Pandaria, I would actually like to note that this was on a stream that I happened to be listening to. Okay. And no, I didn't catch his name, but it's one of the popular WoW streamers. So you can you can look him up. Um, maybe I'll put it on the, uh, we'll put it on Twitter. Yeah. When they were doing Mist of Pandaria, WoW was a very growing market in China. Yeah. But the Chinese government did not want them and the Chinese market did not want them to do Pandaria because they were actually oh, really? thinking... Yep, they actually didn't want it because they wanted the pandas and the panda class to be completely immortal, right? Because a panda is an endangered um, species and is very highly right, revered, just, just as a general. Pandas are great. Pandas should yeah. all be immortal. But because the pandas as a class and as a race, right, couldn't be immortal, that would break the, um, I mean, that would break the game of, of World of Warcraft. Blizzard was actually going against what the, say, market statistics wanted at the time hmm. with Mists of Pandaria. And so there is right some talk of Blizzard, you know, pandering uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, to to that market, but that was absolutely untrue, actually. Yeah, um, interesting. So, so really cool, true fact there. Well, I always like ending with true facts as opposed to like whatever BS I make up off the top of my head. Um, as far as yeah, we have a Twitter account. We have a t so this podcast is a title. I'm not even yeah, gonna tell you. I'm just gonna, gonna I'm just gonna I'm just gonna <laughs> append like me talking at the beginning so that way you know that that's what this is. Um you can follow our Twitter account um foodie-pod, so that's F-U-R-I-D-A-S-H-I-P-O-D. And that's it on Twitter. Um that's mostly me, although hopefully Lauren will take over the Twitter duties occasionally. You definitely will here sooner. Yeah. Um, I definitely just need to move and get a more stable yeah. internet connection at both places. So, But with that having been said, um, thank you all for listening and stay safe, stay be well, and don't die, please. And play games. <laughs> and play games. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs>